on 680 CJOB. Ray Watt, I know you've known uh, to travel the globe as well. So people like you and I used to having to prove that we've had vaccines to visit certain countries, but a vaccine passport for Canada, is it a good idea or bad idea? Or does it depend on what it's used for? It depends on what it's used for. And also it depends on the circumstance on the ground. So vaccination is fantastic. Two doses gives you extraordinarily good protection if it's the Pfizer or Moderna vaccine. But if you're in a very high prevalence area, then the chance of a breakthrough infection is still significant. And the chance you can transmit is also significant. So it's not the only thing we care about, but it's pretty good. And the fact that we're now thinking about, in some cases, deploying these versions of vaccine passports are interesting incentives for additional people to seek vaccination. From strictly an incentive point of view, it can be a powerful tool. So I can see this for travel because you do this anyway with vaccinations internationally, perhaps even domestically. But how about attending an event where there's going to be others there? How do you feel about that? Yeah, so other countries have done this already. Israel, most famously, they have this thing called the Green Pass, I think it's called, where a theater, a gym... Um, a play, an indoor dining, you got to show proof of one of three things. Either you have recovered from COVID, therefore you have immunity, or you've got two doses in you, therefore you've got immunity, or you have a recent negative swab test showing that you're not infectious. And what they did is um, they enforced it heavily, and then bit by bit, people sort of, you know, waving it off and unofficially not enforcing it until it just finally just went away on its own. So initially, it was a hard reminder to people that the disease is still with us and vaccination is our best way back to normal. Then eventually, it kind of just faded away. So the fear most people have is that this becomes a standard way of life and the government is tracking you and controlling your spread through society. But again, experience in other countries suggests it doesn't have to be that way. It actually can be simply a tool to get us back to normal faster and to encourage vaccination. And in that way, it's both a carrot and a stick. Exactly. Now, I understand those who are concerned about this. I share your concerns. I don't like having to produce my papers in order to travel freely about my own society. But this is a public health emergency and individual freedoms have to be curtailed a little bit, at least temporarily. In fact, it has to be temporary. And I think most people gather that in a liberal democracy, this is a temporary restriction. Does it ease your mind a little bit with what Manitoba had to say in, in so much that this digital uh, QR code, if you will, would only really feature my name, it would say Julie Buckingham and maybe show the, I don't even know if it would show the two dates that I received the vaccines, but they say no public um information would be given out on, on my behalf. It would just show my name and that I would be able to show that I have both shots. Is that important that it it not go too far in giving away details? It's very important. Now, other countries like Denmark are rolling their uh, vaccine proof into their overall digital ID system, which is more concerning because then, you know, you can conceivably have access to the other information that's tied to it, including your insurance and, and things like that. Now, Ontario might go that route as well. But it's important that we separate those data streams. Now, my biggest concern actually is when you travel from province to province, if, if you're from Manitoba and you seek go to a theater or an indoor dining opportunity in Toronto, will the person scanning the code in Toronto have access to the database in Manitoba? Like, what are the limits of geographical travel? And if you go abroad, um, how will other how will other countries access this data? But these are solvable problems. Um, but you're right, it's absolutely important that we uh, isolate, segregate, and separate the data so that people do not have their individual privacy compromised. With Ray White, the Unandian from the University of Ottawa, Manitoba reporting 237 new COVID cases today, including two deaths. When you look across the country, how are we doing? You're doing well. Well, well is relative, obviously. You're past the peak. The cases are dropping, and it looks like um, maybe you'll get done the bulk of this wave by the middle of next month, if not the end of this month. Ontario is definitely on track to be done the end of this month. What this means is we can't be complacent. We have to vaccinate on top of that drop in cases to hold them down and to preserve the capacity in the hospital system. I see a lot of optimism right now. Despite the, pre- the presence of the Delta variant, which is, of course, is concerning, all that means is we have to accelerate that second dose into more people. That's the way we get out of this. That's the way we get to normal faster. Right now, 960,400 vaccine doses administered, including over 151,500 who have had their second shot. 
So that's roughly just under 67% of Manitobans have received at least one dose. Um, every, does every percentage point make a difference? It really does. Now, that's actually higher than the national average, I think. So Manitoba is exceeding the rest of Canada. Every, every person who gets vaccinated is a bulk walk in the population against spread penetration of the infection deeper into society. That's what we want. Because one person vaccinated isn't just protecting themselves, they're protecting everybody else they come into contact with. So everybody matters here. Especially if, uh, if there's going to be hesitancy around vaccinating children. We protect the children by making sure that everybody else is vaccinated. And we're still getting questions even today. The vaccine will not prevent necessarily me getting sick. It could, but it is designed to make sure that if I do get sick, that it's I don't wind up in hospital and I don't die. But it is also designed to help prevent me from spreading it to others, correct? There's still a chance that I could get it. There's still a chance I could spread it, but it's far reduced when I have that on board, right? That's right. Think of it as a ladder with the thing that we're really protecting well on top and the things you protect less at the bottom. At the very top, it prevents death extraordinarily well. It prevents hospitalization extraordinarily well. It prevents serious uh, symptoms very well. It prevents any symptoms moderately well. It prevents infection at all somewhat, right? And the uh, Prevention infection at all is the holy grail here, but it's actually doing that. With AstraZeneca, we think maybe 6 to 7% uh, reduction in transmission. With the mRNA vaccines, it could be as high as 80%, depending upon what population we're looking at. The fact that we're seeing any declination in transmission at all is remarkable, and the data out of Israel is very compelling. It shows us that uh, two doses into people um, is really stopping the spread of this disease at all. Not just symptoms, but infection. Ray White, you're an epidemiologist, not a expert on international security. But where are you at on whether this was transferred <laughs> from an animal or is this espionage? I have no idea. Now, it made sense to me throughout this entire thing that it could have come from an animal because that's how all pandemics originate. They're all zoonotic diseases. Animals congregate, usually in wet market environments. They get sick because they're not well cared for and they swap bacteria or viruses and the viruses swap genetic material and learn how to infect humans. That's how we get the flu every year. That's how we get the bad pandemics of the flu every year. It made sense that this was a similar origin, but who knows? You know, uh, there could have been some lab leak issues and let's say it came out of a lab. It doesn't necessarily mean it was engineered. It could just mean it was being studied and it slipped out. So there's a lot of unknowns here. The way I read the data so far is nothing new really has come out since last March. It's just that people's interpretation of the data may have evolved a little bit. But this is well beyond my expertise. I think I'll leave it to people like Jason Kinderchuk, <laughs> who's more of an expert in virology, <laughs> to comment on this. Ray Wide DNN and joining us live on 680 CJOB from the University of Ottawa. In less than 10 minutes, Christian O'Mel.